Hello, we're here with Mr. Tony Juniper, who's special advisor to the uh, Prince's Wing Forest project, the Prince being the Prince of Wales. And Tony Juniper is one of England's best known environmentalists. Prince of Wales is reported to have said forests should not be made worth dead but alive. What are the main activities of the PRP and who are the main actors? The Prince of Wales was most recently inspired to come back to the issue of tropical deforestation because of the challenge posed by climate change. The Prince has spent the last 30 years drawing attention to different ecological challenges, this one included, but the urgency of the carbon dioxide emissions challenge that faces all of humanity is the reason why the Prince's Rainforest Project was established, to find some way in which we could establish at the global level some mechanism to help slow down tropical deforestation which accounts for something like one-fifth of global emissions. So if we are to have a world in which we can stabilize temperature increase below two degrees we must stop tropical deforestation and that was the inspiration of the Prince of Wales in setting up this project. And so finding a way of doing all of that to have the economic benefits without destroying the rainforest that's been the principal job that we set ourselves to do. We've brought forward different proposals, setting out how we believe that international cooperation could lead to the equation being changed from economic incentives to destroy the forests to creating economic incentives to keeping the forests and in so doing, cutting carbon dioxide emissions alongside a whole range of other benefits in terms of conserving biodiversity, protecting rainfall patterns, promoting food security and so on. In that connection, the 13th World Forestry Congress is going to host a forum on forests and climate change. Um, in your opinion, what is the role played by forests uh, in that respect? And how would it be possible to make the international community more aware of it? For the last 10 years or so, the dialogue about climate change has been dominated by different discussions around industrial emissions and emissions from fossil fuels. And so the international community quite rightly has been focused on energy efficiency and how we can move from a fossil-based energy economy to one based more on renewable technologies. And I think during that period over the last 10 years or so since Kyoto, it has been uh, somewhat neglected, the issue of land use change and deforestation as a major driver of, driver of climate change. And the recent science tells us that, you know, we have every good reason to be very concerned about this uh, set of emissions because we cannot, it looks as though uh, we, we cannot at least, arrive at a place where we are going to have a good chance of stabilizing temperature increases below two degrees without actually doing something quite dramatic to stabilize deforestation at the same time. And it's vital now that the international community, the private sector, NGOs, indigenous communities unite in finding ways in which we, which we can bring this situation under control. Because not only are the tropical forests in particular a major source of carbon dioxide emissions, they are also a major sink for the emissions coming from other sectors, including uh, from the transport sector and from the power generation sector. We absolutely must find a way of stabilising deforestation, and I don't think it's going to be one single thing, of course not, but what we do have to do in order to enable all the good things that have to happen is we have to change the economics of this, because it, whichever way you look at it, the rainforests are being cleared for economic reasons, and so changing the economic incentives to change behaviour has to be at the top of the list. One of the main aims, goals of this forum on forests and climate change is to produce a recommendation of a technical nature, which will be later presented at a meeting in Copenhagen uh, this year in December. What do you think would be the two main messages that should be included in this recommendation? I think the two, the two principal messages I would uh, suggest need to be there is the one that links stabilising deforestation to poverty alleviation. And I think countries have to uh, be given the very strong and believable uh, impression that changing their deforestation patterns isn't going to be a trade-off against meeting their poverty alleviation objectives. So any communication of a technical nature, I think, has to show how it's going to be possible to sustain levels of economic development at the same time as cutting deforestation rates. And these two objectives in the past has been a tendency to see them as choices. We have to find a way to making them part of the same program, to cut poverty, to improve people's welfare, to improve educational standards and access to health care, to improve job security, all these things, economic growth in rural areas, at the same time as cutting deforestation. That is an absolutely central message. I think the other message that needs to come through is that we have to find fair ways of doing this. 
And so the global community has to take responsibility for global climate change as an international community. But I don't think it would be um, very good to give the impression that halting deforestation is an alternative to cutting industrial emissions. So cutting emissions from coal-fired power stations or from uh, the transport sector, for example, in the Northern Hemisphere. So I think if we can do this, if we can give the impression, uh, the correct impression, that there isn't a choice between poverty alleviation and stopping deforestation, and that also we have to take action at all levels to cut industrialised emissions as well, I think that would be a very positive contribution to the Copenhagen deliberations. This is a time of deep global crisis, and you started out as an ornithologist. Mm. And there's a lot of twittering going on in the forests, <laughs> and Twitter is also one of the main Web 2.0 uh, um, technical tools for communications these days and also to raise awareness. If forests were to Twitter, what would they be twittering about? I think they'd be twittering about the changing relationships with people that have taken place in the last, say, few hundred years since the industrial age. And I think if the forests could talk, they would reflect back and reminisce about the time when people lived in harmony, relative harmony, with the ecosystems that sustained humankind. And of course, many people, the indigenous people in particular, still live with that relationship, living in harmony with nature, connected with nature, understanding nature's cycles and their philosophy being informed by the, by the finite abilities of nature. I think in the industrialized age, where we've become used to unending economic growth, we've lost that connection. And I think if the forest could Twitter on the internet, they'd be calling for us to reconnect with them in a mutually beneficial relationship whereby humankind can prosper and the forest can be kept intact. Um, we thank Tony Juniper for being with us. Thank you very much for your availability. From London, Green Park, Clarence House, that's all for the moment. Hope to see you at the World Forest Congress. I do hope so. Thank you.